Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us for this week's edition of the SMIE Consulting Midweek Roundup. I'm your host, Marty Bennett, and today on the Roundup, we're going to be answering three questions we've been hearing from international educators over the last seven days. And today, uh, we're back in the home office uh, for the first time in a few weeks after a lot of travel over the last month or two. And happy to be back uh, chatting with you live uh, with uh, the old old handy map in the background to uh, remind us all of where what industry we're in and uh, the joy that we have in the places we get to visit around the world and interact with students and scholars uh, from around the world. So today on the Roundup, as we do each week, we take the questions we ask from our newsletter that uh, comes out on Mondays each week. Uh, from our, you can subscribe to that on our website at smieconsulting.org slash subscribe. I'm also going to drop the link to the email version as well as the LinkedIn version of that newsletter. And between the two of them, we now have um, over 800 and 1,850 subscribers. So really pleased by how many people are now making uh, the the midweek or the our newsletter called "All the SMIE News Fit to Share," uh, and in case you're wondering, SMIE stands for Social Media and International Education. Uh, all those uh, subscribers, grateful to you making us a part of your weekly edif international edification. And as we do each week, we take those uh, the themes from several of the stories that we see in the newsletter uh, on Mondays, and we talk about those here on Wednesdays in more depth. You get our hot takes on Monday on how those might impact what we do in international education. Here on Wednesdays, we go more in depth into three of those common themes that we see developing each week. So if you haven't already uh, subscribed, you can do so uh, through our website or through LinkedIn, whichever way you prefer. But we'll get straight to the questions of the week. And the first of the three questions is one that is near and dear to my heart, and it all has to do with communications with prospective students, international students. And uh, we're, we're leading with, an, uh, the question is, how and what should you be communicating to future students from overseas? And the, these are the kinds of questions that have to be foundational to what you do as an institution, as an international admissions institution. Every institution has a strategic plan. Every institution has values that they preach, uh, that uh, they hope that they uh, translate into marketing messages for international students. All of these are part of what we do in international education. And uh, that happens at the institution-wide level for domestic admissions to alumni audiences to other audi external audiences, but also to international students. Now, what do you need? How are you communicating, and what you are communicating are two very different things. Obviously, uh, the how is the tools and the platforms that you decide to pick uh, to reach your intended audiences, and you have to ask yourself. Are you on the right ones for the right audiences that you're, you're targeting? Uh, you also want to know uh, what kind of content your audience wants to hear. And there's a couple of articles that, uh, that I'll be sharing with you here, first of which is from our friends at Inted. Uh, their blog uh, this week, this past week was, did you say something? I've already scrolled on. So it's tips, uh, the article really focuses on tips uh, for how you can craft messaging for students uh, not only on the platforms that they're using, but also on the right devices that they're using. And we all know that our uh, our teens these days are glued to their devices, their phones typically, and that they during not let's see 43 let's see 43 percent of their waking hours of uh, for U.S. teens is spent online, seven hours, 22 minutes each day looking at screens. So uh, that is. Uh, another another vendor, Common Sense, has stats that show teens are on their screens eight and a half hours per day outside of school-related screen time, which is an important distinction there. So uh, those uh, those times are significant uh, that they're on those devices and on pl different platforms, social platforms, messaging platforms that clearly uh, are vital to their day-to-day -day lives. So do you have a presence on those platforms uh, and have content that is 
designed to be readable on a mobile device, whether it's video content or uh, short messages. Certainly you don't want to be putting any long screeches of, uh, of content onto uh, digital platforms that students are going to be uh, using on mobile devices. So uh, you talk about the kinds of programs uh, in terms of the, the how is, the, is those, those platforms and on uh, designing content for mobile devices. The what is a very different, uh, different topic altogether. And the what uh, has to do with the video content that you might be using. For example, uh, if you're into short form videos, which you should be if you're on TikTok or Instagram at all, uh, that is what uh, the most what posts typically gather the highest levels of engagement. ICEF Monitor has a piece this week, past week, called The Art of the Short Viral Video for International Student Recruitment. Excellent resource there. Uh, talks about uh, what makes sense for for TikTok and, and Insta and in terms of the the value of these kind of things is that uh, getting on, on, on your future audiences uh, for your page on TikTok or on the recommenda recommendations page on, on Insta, whatever it might be. Uh, but they give five tips in this ICEF Monitor article for reaching prospective students with short form video. Finding out first what, through research that you do what your competitors are doing when it comes to these kind of videos, uh, what uh, uh, what is trending, what kinds of videos are trending when you open up uh, TikTok or Reels or, or Insta, whatever it might be, or on YouTube, short short reels, uh, short form videos on YouTube as well. Uh, look at the hashtags, the sounds, the music that is resonating uh, in those. Uh, in those discover uh, videos that are popping. Uh, you want to uh, find out what's working in particular markets. And for international uh, students, that, that's a little, maybe a little bit harder to do to get that on the ground uh, impact. But if you have uh, an alumni network, if you have uh, current students that have recently come to your institution from abroad in some of your key markets, doing focus groups with them to find out what's, what's really popping on social media in their markets, their home markets. Uh, doing the TikTok, ch TikTok challenges in certain markets if, if those are trending in your target countries and engaging with influencers in that market uh, to, to maybe get them to uh, say something nice about your institution. Those are the kinds of things that you can do. Uh, then it's uh, a, a, an important part about these short viral video uh, success tips is not to lecture. Uh, you don't want to be and uh, uh, don't want to focus on uh, really t teaching them something necessarily or speaking at them. You want to try and become friends uh, in terms of create a friendship-like relationship, as they say, with the fans and uh, commenting on that, on what they say and uh, re-engaging with them that, in that respect. So that's certainly a, a good advice there. Making sure you have a hook. And uh, the, there's information in this article that Gen Z's attention span is down to eight seconds. So that's the time you have to, in your first eight seconds, to really grab their attention and potentially get them to watch the remaining 30, 60 seconds that you have left. A bold fact, sharing a secret, be shocking or surprising a little bit, a problem and hint at a solution that you might have, uh, ask questions that viewers want the answers to. Those kinds of things are a good way to give it a hook, as they say. And finally, uh, the tip, last tip is to comment and encourage comments. And that's always good practice on social media is if someone comments on your stuff, you want to comment on what they say and uh, thank them for their engagement and, and maybe take the conversation to another level. So great, great piece by uh, ICEF Monitor on that in terms of helping uh, identify the kinds of tips that will be useful to prospective students. Uh, next one up is one from QS uh, that talks about Gen Z uh, and particularly Gen Z business school students and what's on top of their wish list. So if, you have, if you're responsible for marketing to uh, future MBA students or business school students, this is an article that might make sense for you to, to read as well. And this QS midweek, midweek brief uh, report uh, co covers, uh, goes in depth into what COVID uh, has done to Gen Z students and in terms of their expectations uh, for uh, university and what's coming in their careers uh, and those types of things are going to be pretty important. But knowing what they want to hear is another uh, important factor and uh, talking about topics like sustainability, equity, importance of problem solving, those are kind of things, effect on climate, all of those pieces of the puzzle are 
important messages that, in this case, from this uh, QS article, that you would want to focus on uh, in, in talking and meeting your audience where they are on topics that make sense to them. And ultimately, that's what every successful uh, recruitment strategy is based around, is, is making connections with students on topics that they want to hear about, uh, that they feel uh, a connection with you as a result, that there is uh, a reason why uh, they want to pursue a relationship with your institution, or at least see where it goes. Uh, so there's some really strong, uh, in these articles that we shared today, some really strong examples of what you can be doing in terms of the how you communicate and what you communicate with your future students as ma in making uh, your approach to uh, communication with your target audiences uh, much more focused and much more on point for what they want to hear. Uh, ultimately, that's what every, everyone hopes that their campaigns do. Uh, their comm flows uh, messaging happens, their social media posts, all of that. They hope that they're reaching students where they are on topics that matter to them. But how often do we find that out first before we design our messaging? It's often the other way around, isn't it? So uh, let's move on to question two for the week. And that is, will the United States be number one forever and have two million international students by 2030? Now, uh, it's no surprise that the uh, U.S. has been the number one destination for international students for many decades uh, since record keeping really began. And the, uh, when I say number one forever, it's a little tongue in cheek. Uh, that may not be the case, but we have consistently been so. Other countries have gotten close in the last few years. Australia got close. Uh, Canada got close. The U.K. has gotten close. But look what's happened to them. In the last year, each of those markets... Okay, and there was even reports that Canada's numbers were pushing a million this year, uh, and that, or this past year, and that uh, kind of freaks a lot of us out in the United States. They only have 300 universities and colleges, and how are they able to manage a million international students? Well, look what a million international students did, if that's the case, to Canada. Uh, housing shortages all across the country in major and metropolitan areas, as well as small towns that over and universities that oversubscribed internationally to fund uh, their, keep their doors open and fund expansion. Uh, dozens, hundreds of uh, dozens of. Uh, Pub, private colleges who uh, survived on international students, where they were 60, 70 percent international, uh, are now in a very, and when I say public, private colleges there, I'm talking about vocational institutions primarily that uh, aren't bachelor's degree granting institutions for the large, most part. Uh, the students that they're producing have typically been coming in and using their two or three year degrees as pathways to work and eventually residency and citizenship. Those doors are, have been closing and much of the cap uh, talk in Canada of the limit on to 325,000 or 30 percent drop in the total numbers uh, admitted to Canada uh, for study permits in the next couple of years, a lot of those cuts are coming to those pu private colleges and some publics as well who had significant public-private partnerships and uh, helped, helped uh, those ha had those to help fund a lot of their programs. So these public-private partnerships uh, the, are taking, have taken a hit in Canada. Uh, the caps that have been put in place are going to be targeting uh, those uh, particular, as they're apportioned across the country, targeting those uh, uh, certainly significant cuts to the, the public, to the private colleges. Uh, you see in Canada also the rising of the uh, minimum income that, or uh, funding that students needed to provide, going from $10,000 to $20,000. And uh, the ones that had been benefiting from that lower amount, no matter where they were going, they had to prove at least $10,000, now are having to double that amount to get in order to get a study permit. And those that were likely showing those minimum amounts were ones that are likely going to those public colleges. It's a very different demographic uh, of, say, for example, Indian students going to Canada primarily for vocational study as opposed to those coming to uh, the United States, which for the lion's share, 70, 80% of in recent years have been coming for postgraduate study, master's degrees, or doctoral programs. So. Uh, that is a, an impact for Canada. In the UK, you've seen the net migration uh, debate uh, result in the dependent study visa ban, uh, that uh, unless you're coming for a PhD program in the, United, in the United Kingdom, you cannot bring family with you. And as a result, those numbers in key markets, India, Nigeria, have tanked as well. Uh, 
uh, student num visa numbers are down 27% in the last year. So they are taking bigger hits. They might take an even bigger hit if the graduate route, uh, which is their post-study work visa, uh, gets uh, fooled with at all or limited in any way down to six months, I think it was, in the, when Theresa May uh, first got rid of it in 2007 or 9, I think. So we see um, what's happening uh, in other countries. Australia introduced the Genuine Student Test, which again is targeting primarily vocational institutions in Australia as a w way to minimize on net migration numbers those that are coming for these low-paying jobs uh, that are overqualified for the jobs are the instant degrees that they, they're applying for coming into vocational colleges and just using that as a path to work and residency. So the, uh, the number one piece is uh, is coming in in two, uh, two different ways, really. It's uh, coming from the existing data on current international students in the United States and other major markets that the U.S. still has well over a million in, uh, international students enrolled, and those numbers will only be increasing in the years to come. Uh, the two articles that I'm sharing first are from IIE, uh, that has uh, their 2030 outlook on what uh, the numbers look like for uh, international st students in the United States. I heard this actually while I was in Thailand a couple weeks ago uh, as part of a IIE International Academic Partnership Program uh, visiting universities in Thailand. Uh, the co-president of IIE, Jason Sizz, uh, made several uh, announcements about this, referring to this uh, article from IIE about their Outlook 2030, that he said on several occasions during the trip in public uh, settings with these university folks that the U.S. Is, may have 2 million international students by 2030. That's six years away that we could have two million international students nearly doubling what we have now. That's, that's a pretty significant jump if you think about it and how long it took us to get to one million, uh, that we could be doubling that in the next six years uh, potentially. So that's, that's a pretty significant uh, story uh, that we could potentially have two million international students in the United States. And you gotta think about it, in, in Canada, in, in Australia, international students studying at the vocational level make up almost half, if not more than half, of the total international students studying there. Uh, in the United States, our vocational students, as a part of our million plus, are a very small fragment, less than, uh, certainly less than 10% of our total students, probably less than 7%, I think. So uh, in the United States, our post-secondary bachelor's, master's, doctoral level students that are in the United States are significantly higher than uh, what you find in Canada, UK, and um, Australia. So uh, the n other part of this equation is will the U.S. stay number one? Uh, number one is uh, obviously, uh, we're number one, we all, all love to say that. Uh, recent IDP uh, survey in their latest version of Emerging Futures has uh, the United States for the first time in several years uh, on top as the uh, policies, anti-immigrant anti policies of the UK, Canada, and Australia are putting students off uh, interest in studying in those, discipline, in those areas. So we've got two ways U.S. is number one, uh, number one in terms of total numbers right now, but also number and future numbers potentially for, for eternity. Uh, you could see uh, in the, the, in, uh, amongst prospective students, U.S. has risen up to the, to the number one uh, preferred destination of students according to this II, uh, IDP survey, Emerging Future Survey, and 110 or 100,000 students, I think, from uh, several different countries uh, in around the world. Uh, I don't know the exact, let's t check the numbers there. It's in the article, uh, sorry, 11,500 students from 117 countries were asked. So some really significant numbers there and showing uh, how the United States has certainly rebounded from uh, the early years uh, of the Trump administration where there were certainly drops and the anti-immigrant rhetoric there. And now other countries, Australia, UK, Canada, are certainly experiencing that anti-immigrant piece, maybe not to the same extent that we had it in the U.S., but certainly uh, when it comes to um, this latest report, we're back on top for, uh, for that uh, uh, for the for the foreseeable future in my in my estimation. So that is question number two. Now the final question of the day is a little bit of a downer for uh, my colleagues across the pond, uh, many of which I'll be seeing in three weeks at NAFSA. Uh, but in terms of our dark days ahead for UK universities, 
Um, many of them will say privately that they're already here. And they're here because of the actions, as I was just alluding to in the last uh, last um, last question answer about what government policies in other countries have done to kind of depress interest in studying in Canada, in Australia, and the UK. Uh, you've seen in the UK, there's been uh, several uh, events happening recently. Uh, we've talked about the potential threat to the graduate route visa. We've talked about um, what uh, their, the dependent study ban that was introduced. Uh, there are other things happening. There are talks of of, uh, I mentioned the UK study visa applications are down 27% in the last two years. So there's some real structural challenges to uh, what international students are, uh, are facing if they're looking at the UK as a study destination right now. So when it comes to uh, examples of what we're talking about here, uh, in addition to the stud study visa drops 27%, in addition to uh, the, uh, we now have employers like KPMG, one of the largest employers of, of, uh, in the UK, they are canceling foreign graduate job offers after the UK has government has tightened the visa rules. So they've taken these steps uh, when that, uh, when because the government has kind of decided to cut record immigration numbers, net migration numbers, uh, it's one of the big four, KPMG is one of the big four firms uh, that they uh, have canceled offers that they've already put out. So that's a pretty significant jump that some of the recent hires have now been refused jobs, and for the international students, that's devastating. Uh, in terms of what their future might might hold now. So, and the reason why is the government has increased the minimum salaries for uh, international students, for skilled workers from 26,200 pounds to 38,700 pounds. Uh, and uh, for that's for skilled workers and to 30,960 pounds for people under the age of 26. So uh, that's, um, the typical salary, first year graduate salaries are between 25K and 35K, thousand pounds in the UK. So uh, those, are, those are ones that are now, um, their lower end hires are junior actuaries. Uh, they are, well, no, the junior actuaries are exempt from this, at least for KPMG. But uh, our overseas graduates who need skilled worker visas outside of London, that's another caveat there, are no longer going to be eligible for jobs. You also see at the university level, 50 plus universities, that's fully a third of the universities in the UK. It's about 150 universities in the UK. Fully a third of them are cutting jobs because of the drops in overseas students that they're seeing. As early as this past January, the impact is being felt already that these academic job losses are coming because of the decrease in the number of students. You see, uh, we saw in the UK, uh, or we saw in the US post uh, election of, of Donald Trump in 26, November 2016, we saw the You Are Welcome Here campaign start in the US. And that was a specific reaction to the election of a president who was is, is very anti-immigrant uh, rhetoric and policies that he eventually implemented. Uh, caused a reaction, and that was, you are welcome here. Uh, the UK, uh, in the early early teens, uh, started a similar program called uh, We Are International, and that uh, has that kind of faded away in the last uh, five years or so, but has now been relaunched to boost the welcome factor for the UK universities as a reaction to all the anti-immigrant policies that have been implemented by the government, to still show that they're their institutions are safe, uh, that uh, they are welcoming, that international students as a whole are welcome on their campuses. So these are the kinds of things that uh, UK institutions are dealing with right now. And as you can imagine, it's a pretty daunting time if you're on that side of the desk in, in the UK to try and um, it makes the government's actions certainly make uh, their lives a lot harder as they try to uh, defend uh, kind of defend their institutions and defend the country and what they, they know is the country as a, as a welcoming destination for international students. So it's a real shame, frankly, that it's, it's come to this, uh, but uh, it's the reality that uh, our, my colleagues in England are facing right now in terms of what, uh, what they can do. 
And right now, uh, you, f you see what's happening. Uh, you can there's not necessarily a light at the end of the tunnel for the UK uh, uni fr friends. Uh, they are hoping that the elections coming up uh, at the end of 2024, beginning of 25, will sweep uh, the Conservatives out of power and put in a, the Lib Dems or Labor Party that will have our coalition government that will be much more sympathetic to international students. Uh, so that's yet to be seen if that will happen, but certainly uh, there's, uh, there's certainly that would, that was their great hope. Much like in the U.S., uh, we're feeling uh, Trump 2.0 and what that might look like as an impact uh, if, no, if the November elections go a certain way, uh, what that might have for our industry. Maybe we're going to be resurrecting your welcome here. But still, uh, the ch these are a lot of what we're talking about. These are swings and roundabouts, as I say, across the pond uh, for how uh, we deal with the different uh, world events and uh, political climates in our countries that impact what we do. And certainly uh, we're not immune to the kinds of, uh, of challenges that governments face uh, when bringing in uh, students from overseas or having policies that either make it easier or harder for international students to enroll. Uh, so we'll see where it goes. Uh, we're, uh, we're not going to be eating crow. Uh, we may be eating crow in a while if it doesn't go our way in November. But certainly uh, you see a lot of conflicts uh, around the world uh, in, within governments that are about immigration and about migration of peoples to their countries and what that impact has on the rest of the population, on jobs, on housing, on health care. All of these different areas are touched by uh, migration and immigration in various ways. And international students are part of that equation and oftentimes get tarred with the wrong brush uh, for some of the, the bad side of immigration that impacts some, some countries around the world. So that's all we have for you this week on the Midweek Roundup. Thanks again for making us a part of your weekly international edification. Certainly those watching on repeat on YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, or Facebook, really appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your week to watch us or listen to us. And again, the audio-only podcast version uh, is available on all major podcast providers. At uh, searching Midweek Roundup, you'll find us there. Looking forward to chatting with you again soon for the next couple of weeks at the home office before doing a live at the end of the month from the NAFSA Expo Hall floor. Until then, we look forward to chatting again soon. Cheers.